This here is the lawsuit I filed on my general contractor for the Million Dollar Ben's site, and this is their response. Two years ago, our farm embarked on the largest project it's ever done. The Million Dollar Ben's site. A facility that would store all of the corn and soybeans that we raised on all of our acres. For our farm, this was a once in several generations project. My grandfather worked his entire life to be able to put up this Ben's site. My dad worked his entire life to be able to put up this bend site. All the work that I've done since I've been working on the farm, as well as my brother, has gone in to making this project become a reality. My family has so much blood, sweat, and tears invested into this project that we wanted to make sure that it was done with an experienced hand guiding everything along. So we sought out a general contractor that has been in business for over 40 years. After a bunch of discussions and a lot of planning, this is the project that was proposed to us. The idea behind it is this was phase one, which is 250,000 bushels of storage. Then this would be phase two, which would be 500,000 bushels of storage, which would basically just be two more bins built onto it. And then this would be phase four. So phase three would be two more bins, then we'd have six. Phase four would be all eight bins. But this is where we're starting. This is the proposal that we signed turning it into the contract for the bin. So I've done everything that would be expected from the contractor as well as everything that would be expected from us. So these two bins were to be brand new. One of the legs was going to be new. The overhead structure was new and the pit was new. The dryer was going to be reused. The hopper bottom bin was going to be reused. The leg tower was going to be reused. And then one of the legs going to be reused. This proposal includes all erection and assembly labor, concrete, rebar, supports, transitions, spouting, and anchor bolts. And then this is all the stuff that's not included. Total price for this proposal is $930,517. Then if we flip back a couple pages, it says, this document contains the entire understanding and agreement between the parties. No additional verbal agreements, statements, or representations shall bind either party unless the same are reduced to writing, dated, and signed by both parties and a copy attached to this agreement. In a nutshell, the final price is for everything to do everything in this picture besides the dryer shack. Unless there is a written change order. That's there to protect the contractor and it's there to protect us. Long story short, the contractor started work in June and then six months later, they labeled the project substantially complete with a few punch list items to go. And around the end of September, the beginning of October, when they started getting things actually up above the bends, then that's when we started to notice our first initial set of problems. And then as the winter months set in and then that winter vicious 40 mile an hour winds started coming through with ice and snow, is where we really started to notice issues. This was also around the time the contractor submitted us with the final bill for the contract of $142,887.78. He also gave us a credit memo of $29,211. That was for all the work that was supposed to be done on the contract that didn't get done. It was basically everything around the drying system of the Ben site. And then he had a final sheet he gave us with a bill of $158,763 for additional work and materials. At this point, we've discovered issues around the bin site and we were just slapped with an extra $159,000 bill. So I figured it would be a good idea to get my attorney involved. So we sent a letter to the contractor saying pursuant to the terms of the written contract, any changes from the above specifications involving extra materials or labor will be executed upon written change orders. And my lawyer stated, I am not aware that any written change orders were executed regarding this project. So one and a half page letter to the contractor but it continues on to say, my client also has serious concerns regarding the structural integrity and workmanship of the grain handling system. To that of which my contractor's lawyer responded, your client certainly would have been better served if the expert who allegedly critiqued the welding and quality of construction on this project would have stepped forward long ago and pointed out the facts that support the conclusion set forth in your letter, which states, my client also has serious concerns regarding the structural integrity and workmanship of the grain handling system. 
It has always mystified me that these concerns are never voiced until it's time to pay the final bill. At this point, I knew I needed to get someone a little more in tune with this kind of stuff, so I went straight to a construction litigation lawyer in the big city, and we ended up filing our suit. This packet of papers is the lawsuit, and it has to deal with the serious structural concerns that we are having around the Ben site. And until the case unfolds more and more things happen within the case, I'm not going to go over the fine details for what we are suing for. I want to be very careful with everything that's going on here because there is a lot of reputation that can be destroyed on things and, and that is not my intent. I just want to be fair on things. So I'm not going to be facetious towards any of this stuff. And we're going to just be treading on the things that we have papers like two lawyers or things that have proven to be said, which basically is in writing. So that way we're not harming anybody in this process. And if you know who my contractor is, I, I don't want any negativity to be towards that. Cause I mean, I feel we were really wronged out of the whole deal, but that's not constitute for anybody else to go try to wrong that person because that's a deal between me and them, not you and them, even though they did things to us. And I want the court to be able to say, yes, this stuff was absolutely wrong, or no, this stuff was absolutely wrong. I a thousand percent believe I'm correct in everything that I'm arguing for here, but at the end of the day, I, I need it to be a very real thing because there's a lot of voice we have with what we're doing here by making this video. So I just want to be careful to protect every party involved as much as I can. But at the same time, if this is truly what's going on and we're getting pressed for these things, that is, A, it's insulting all the work my grandfather, my father, my brother, and I have done over the years. And frankly, it's theft. And theft is messed up. And that's not something I condone. And I don't wanna see other people be going through something like this. So if I can prevent somebody else from maybe having this going on with either the same contractor or their own contractor, maybe you can learn something from this. That's my intention behind this. It's not to drag the contractor through the mud because he has to go to sleep with himself at night. So, I mean, he has his own problems to worry about. So that, that's not regarding you and that's not regarding me. Okay? So that's, that's where we're sitting when it comes to that. So here we are. This is the response to the lawsuit. So I'm gonna sit down and read through every single line item, and then I'm gonna write my thoughts down. All right, today we're working on the 16 row. Me and Dad ripped all the gauge reels off today. And these are all getting tore off of them. This is a new one. All right, this was last year, two years ago, whatever. But you kinda see the height difference in them. There you can see these are getting the edges wore off. Um, a lot of them are just getting tore up, looking pretty bad. So we're gonna get new rubbers. Well, rubbers are 65 bucks a piece. And that's just this outer ring. And you know, if you're gonna go ahead and split them, you might as well put new bearings in them because it takes quite a bit to split these. You gotta take four outer bolts out and then these three middle and spread them. They don't come apart very easy because they're rust. So 65 bucks a piece and then for the bearing it's 30. So there's 95 bucks and you can get an aftermarket wheel. It's complete all like this. This is not an aftermarket, but you can get an aftermarket one for $103. So. Time you figure in, tearing apart, putting together everything, it's not worth it. Got 25 new ones coming because we got seven good ones. Once we started tearing apart, we realized there was probably a slot in the gauge wheel arms. This shaft right here just goes through, this bolt right here holds it in place. Here's the old one. You can kind of see the grooves in them, especially right there. See how much slops there. And if we take a new bushing, which is this one here, slide it on the new arm. There's no play. So got new bushings. There's two per arm. Go in here. Uh, come over on the 24 row. We got uh, called these air system. Goes on where you control your meter fans. Goes on this little hydraulic block right here. Usually you have to get out and spin that dial. And then every time you spin it, you gotta walk up front to look at your gauges. You got two, one on each side. Those are the airflow to your meter. Not enough air. You'll get skips in your plates. So if you don't have enough air, you have like a seat here, seat here. You're skipping skipping spots in your plate. If you have too much air, you'll shove doubles in. So then you're putting extra seeds in each little slot. You'd rather have doubles, more doubles and skips, but 
You'd rather have it in that sweet spot and trying to get in the sweet spot when you're switching seat all the time, getting in and out of the cab, moving that dial. is a pain in the butt because you go 50 feet, that crap, spin it too much. So then you got to get out and spin it. All it does is this is will bolt on top and it mounts to your shaft on your little pump on the planter. And then it comes a little on remote and then you can do them from the cab. You can spin them from the cab. These move really slow, so you can fine tune them. I read through everything on this sheet. So this is broken down into four parts. The first part is the answer, which is the answer to all the allegations I provided in my lawsuit. The second part is their affirmative defenses. So that is basically their reasonings for their answers. The third part is their counterclaim, so what they're asking from us. And then the fourth part is they demand a jury trial if it goes to trial. So. My initial thoughts. The lawsuit I filed had 50 allegations. Now about half of those allegations were things like the final contract price was this, the agreed upon use of the Ben site was that. So for ones like those, they just say, yes, we admit that is what the contract price was. And about the other half of the answers is the problems that we've had. And so they either just flat out denied them or they denied part of it and accepted another part, or they denied and they explain why they denied. Some of these answers are just little detailed denials, like, no, I wasn't the one talking to Cole. It, that guy was the one talking to Cole, and he's the one who said that. They said that they offered to visit the site and converse with me over a complaint, and that they were run off and then ordered not to come on site. It appears they're trying to say things are our fault and we're not running things the way they told us to run them, which is why we're having the problems that we're having. And they claimed I wouldn't allow them on the premises again. They say that many of the complaints were never mentioned and that this is the first time that we've ever voiced any of the complaints to them before. They said I didn't allow them to come on the premises again. One of the big things that we've been asking for is just to see the engineered plans behind everything and we just get responses back like they've been building the catwalks the same way for 25 years without a single failure and the catwalks are stronger than the ones being built by the competition using a different design or they say things like the contractors have erected literally hundreds of similar projects calling for similar components and the subcontractors have assembled literally hundreds of similar systems so i'm glad they've been able to build a ton of structures over the years those accolades don't really mean anything to me. I, I just want to see the, the engineered plan. And then some of the lines have an answer, but it doesn't pertain to what our allegation was. For example, we said that we attempted to use the project for grain handling, but the project was ineffective and unfit for grain storage up to the maximum storage capacity of the bins and for the safety of the plaintiff, to which they responded, it emphatically denies and states affirmatively that plaintiff has now used the grain handling system for two years. We've used it for two years and we've been able to put grain into it, but we're saying filling things full, things aren't safe and it's not fit to fill things full. The hopper bottom bin would be a great example of that. And then for their affirmative defenses, basically their reasonings for why they gave the answers for what they did above, they are claiming impossibility of performance, prevention of performance and waiver, and failure to mitigate damages. And their affirmative defense on the lack of written change order was these two cases. They cited Central Iowa Grading versus UDE Corp as well as another one, which was Palmer versus Glassbrenner. And then in their counterclaim, they're just saying that they have a 1.5% monthly finance charge on an unpaid balance. So they say we owe $317,492. And then last but not least, they want to have a jury. After reading through this, it's very interesting. This is the first lawsuit I've ever been a part of. Dad's been a part of a lawsuit before in 1986 when we built the big machine shed. The guy we financed the building through claimed that we didn't pay him for the building. And he also claimed that we didn't pay him rent on ground. We were renting from him for 10 years. And he forged a bunch of documents and stuff. So dad and grandpa had to go for court for, heh. Words. And they ended up winning that case, but that was in 1986. And so now here we are almost 40 years later. It did a whole different ball game, but it's just, it's a very interesting process. I'm not gonna lie. It's not as immediate as you would like to think it is. And the stuff that is just blatantly obvious to you can be denied. And 
then you have to prove all those things. So I guess that's part of it. And I guess if I was being accused of things that I would want to have the chance to be able to prove them as well. So, I mean, I guess we're being accused of things. They're being accused of things. So we're going to bring our cards to the table and we're going to see who has proof on what and who's telling the truth and who's not. I guess this could be a pretty long process. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty pricey process too. I think today marks like day 116 or something like that of working on the 24 row planter and the 16 row planter. I was in the office all day yesterday so let's see what dad and Cooper got done. bunch of the bolts, washers, different things on the 16 row planter. We threw it in some cleaner here so everything ain't all greasy. Our old piece that was on here, our bushing was getting reamed out really, really bad. So instead of buying a whole new piece, Cooper had some pieces made up. Cut the old piece off, which was this one. If you can see how reamed that is. And then he's gonna weld a new one on and then we'll put the bushings in the new ones. So Cooper welded them back on. He got them painted. So they're all sitting here drying now. So now we have perfect holes. Cooper had some smart thinking on that one because that would have cost us like $2,000 to do the whole planter if we had to get new ones on there and he did it for a couple hundred bucks. Our mechanic Scott came out this morning and we think we figured out the problem with the mysterious oil leak on the 340. Notice how there's a little bit of oil just kind of randomly splattered on this stuff. This was just power washed the other day so none of that should be there. Let it run for like five hours today. Up behind there somewhere. There's a seal or something and it must be dripping just a little bit. Ends up falling on these pulleys that spin and then so it's just kicking a little bit of oil over here. Scott just came out and ordered some parts for that. We just gave him the serial number. He said it would be one of those things if we had to run during planting season, we'd be fine because it's it's dripping very slowly. It's just, it's gonna need to be addressed at some point. Otherwise it's just gonna make a mess all the time. We ordered parts for both of the planters. We're waiting on those. We're waiting on parts for the 340. We're waiting for our lawyer to write up our response. And you are waiting for your new Cornstar Farms merch to get to your house in the mail. So visit the link in the description. That's all I got for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.